Right. Hello. Hello. Hi. Welcome, everybody. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is the third webinar in our series, Transforming Places with Donut Economics, where we hear directly from change makers from around the world that are putting donut economics into practice in their own place. Uh, my name is Leonora. I'm the Citizen Regions Lead at the Donut Economics Action Lab. I'm joined here today by my colleague, uh, Rob Shorter, our Communities and Art Lead. Uh, I'm a Macedonian joining this call from London, where I live. So I welcome everybody to introduce themselves in the chat. Let us know who you are, who you are where you're joining us from, why you're joining us. Um, so today's webinar will focus on the built environment. Ever since Donut Economics was first published, practitioners from the built environment sector have been exploring the potential of the donut to guide, to inform, and to inspire spatial projects of all scales, from the design of new buildings or retrofit of old ones, to neighborhood scale urban plans, to spatial strategies for entire towns and cities. And many have already started experimenting with this, learning and innovating alongside us at the Donut Economics Action Lab. And today we're very happy to be joined by two amazing presenters that will be sharing their work, um, uh, Charlie and Marie, uh, sharing work happening in Oslo and Norway and in Birmingham in the UK. Um, and before that, before I pass on to our presenters, I'll give a very brief introduction to what is emerging and what we're seeing in the world of donut economics and the built environment. Um, and as before we're getting started, just a few notes about the webinar. This is being recorded and it will be shared back on our platform. So in case you cannot make it for the full event, you can also see it afterwards. Um, we'll start off with a quick presentation uh, that, that I'll share and then each presenter will have uh, a presentation of their own, which will be followed by Q&A. So please write your questions for our speakers in the chat throughout the presentations, and we'll pick them up following each presentation. But also please share any thoughts, comments, links, experiences, suggestions that you have in the chat as, as we go ahead. So um, I will get us started, and I'll just share a few, a few slides. So we start with a big question. What does it mean to put donut economics into practice in the built environment? What does it mean to bring it into architecture planning in the way that we design and plan our buildings, our cities, our neighborhood? And this isn't the question that really has a simple or, or, or singular answer. It's a question that has an evolving answer that we keep on co-creating and building an understanding of as we're working and learning from so many practitioners and change makers around the world. Uh, but it's certainly one that is grounded in the core principles and ambitions of, of donut economics. So designing, building, planning for uh, with donut economics means setting the ambition and the vision to design and play, plan places that help humanity move towards that safe and just place of the donut helping humanity, you know, meet, helping us meet the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. And when we're talking about place-based initiatives, one of the core frameworks to work with is the unrolled donut or the four lenses, as we call them. So every place needs to be setting the ambitions to look both at the social foundation and the ecological ceiling while recognizing local aspirations and the global responsibilities of places. So one of the guiding kind of questions and visions for all places become these four questions of the lenses. How can we design places, build places that help all the people of this place thrive? How can this place be as generous as the wildland next door? How can this place respect the health of the whole planet? And how can it respect the well-being of all people? And then we also need to be recognizing that we need to be contributing towards the shift of the dynamics from divisive to distributive and from the generative to regenerative by design. So designing places with donut economics mean aiming from the onset to be distributive by design, to share opportunity and value with all those who co-created and to be regenerative by design, working with and within the cycles of the living world. And so taking those principles, we are really setting new ambition for those for practitioners in the built environment, an ambition that matches the challenge of the 21st century, as we need to recognize that it is we need to be moving way past 
business as usual, where we're kind of have been guided by the question, how much can we get away with? How much do we need to do uh, so that we can continue extracting and doing our projects whilst we still cause social and environmental damage? But we also need to be moving towards the right of that screen and moving beyond what we've kind of uh, call now mostly sustainable de design guided by the question, how much do we have to do? So what is the minimum we have to do in order to cause no harm? This is no longer enough to just, you know, just about stay in that safe and just space of the donut, but not contribute actively towards giving back. So what donut economics sets is a higher ambition, inviting us alongside many practitioners to move towards regenerative design, to be guided by the question, how much can we possibly do in order to give back to nature, to give back to people, to be nature positive, climate positive, and actually contributing to the well-being of, of all people. So these are kind of the, some of the guiding concepts uh, alongside all the different, all the core principles of donut economics, and how these turned into different pragmatic ways of working within the built environments takes many different shapes. And I'm just going to share some of the Mm, mm, some of the few tendencies of what we're seeing emerge in the built environment and what we're exploring ourselves of different ways to be using donut economics. So one is as a guide for setting visions as a, and ambitions for projects and places. So using these guiding principles, using the core lenses as a way to build visions, to set goals, to set ambitions, to think holistically across different social and ecological dimensions uh, and to be thinking forward into the future. So visioning uh, the kind of the in a holistic way, whether it's a building or a neighborhood or, or a whole town. And a, a second way in which the, the, the donut has been used a lot in the built environment and that really resonates with a lot of practitioners is using it as a framework and using the tools as a way to open new ways to engage with communities and stakeholders, new ways to hold conversations that are holistic, that bridge across uh, different themes, that invite local communities alongside uh, experts that are keep on uh, keep keep us thinking holistically while allowing us to deep dive into different areas of interest that are creative and playful uh, and easy for people to relate to that you know can be used to you know dream up collaborative visions but also to map existing initiatives in a place to recognize the different things that are already happening uh, to map the different uh, types of knowledge that different stakeholders are bringing across the uh, four lenses or across the social and ecological dimensions and then another way that we we see emerging quite a lot is using donut economics as a way to measure measure uh, so work with data and donut economics to measure, to monitor, to set targets. So, so understanding what does it mean to be setting indicators across both social and uh, ecological sites in the built environment for different scales, for different places. What can we measure uh, to, to understand how well we're doing right now and what we should be aiming for. What kind of targets can we set? And can we set targets when we're designing new buildings, when we're retrofitting old ones, when we're dreaming up whole new neighborhoods? What should we be measuring and what should we be aiming for? And how can we be turning you know, the regenerative and distributive by design principles into something that can be uh, measured and monitored throughout time? So these are just some of the ways uh, that, that people are getting started in the built environment. And I'm sure that this list will only continue to extend and grow and become richer and richer as we, um, as we move ahead and continue along on this new journey. On this new journey. But uh, I will now actually pass on to our speakers so that we can hear two examples of how this looks like in practice and how, what kind of deep dives they've taken. Um, I am very happy to be joined firstly by uh, Charlie. Charlie Edmonds is a dark matter designer and an architect at Civic Square. Civic Square is a public square neighborhood lab and creative and participatory platform focused on regenerative civic and social infrastructure within neighborhoods, underpinned by the ideas of donut economics. They're based in, in Birmingham in the UK. And Charlie will share the work 
uh, of working to set an ambition to deeply retrofit a full street in, in Birmingham. Uh, Charlie, the floor is yours. Great, thanks very much. So let me just share this for you guys. Hey, cool, yeah. So yeah, my name is Charlie, I'm from Civic Square. And um, I think mainly today, I just kind of like to give a very brief snapshot into what we're doing in Birmingham in terms of how we're trying to develop a model of engaging with the built environment um, that fits within the sort of framework of the donut and can lead us towards the uh, just transition that we know uh, needs to happen, particularly within our home streets and neighborhoods. So you've already heard a little bit about Civic Square, but um, yeah, just to sort of reiterate, uh, the goal of Civic Square is to create a sort of uh, a kind of civic infrastructure in uh, Ladywood in Birmingham that is sort of uh, grassroots, provides space for communities and neighbors to learn skills, um, improve connections and community resilience, and sort of go beyond the typical um, model of kind of centralized services and amenities that dominate most of our lives in the UK right now. The one way that we are trying to sort of make this happen is all down to where we're based. So we're actually based in uh, these buildings here, which is uh, it's called TubeWorks. It's a, a sort of disused industrial uh, factory in Ladywood. And what we're hoping to do is to take a site like this that in various uh, sort of exploitative ways in the past was the heartbeat of uh, sort of, you know, Victorian colonial uh, England in the widest span of the world, that pivotal uh, role that was once embodied by this space, uh, we want to try and bring that back in a much more ethical, regenerative 21st century way. And in this way, we're hoping that the TubeWorks factory can become the actual embodiment of Civic Square, the actual embodiment of civic infrastructure for uh, a 21st century economy. So this is essentially the sort of core of a lot of the work of um, our vision. But obviously, there's a limit to what you can do just by creating a physical space, one piece of physical infrastructure that can support a community. Everyone who works in the built environment knows that the challenges that we have to face go far beyond a single project and that no single project is ever going to uh, define the entire just transition that we know is needed. So despite that being our sort of long-term goal for the site, Civic Square, uh, something like not having a finished building won't stop us. So we do plenty of organizing uh, with neighbors uh, in the space as it currently stands. We organize trips to places like the Center for Alternative Technology to improve skills, knowledge, and capacity on the street. And you can see here um, a few of the various initiatives that Civic Square has launched. So from learning about the built environment to peer-to-peer uh, -peer education networks to research on scaling down the donut to the scale of a neighborhood. We've tried to sort of engage in many different sectors of the work of donut economics at the scale of Ladywood, at the, at the scale of the neighborhood. So how does this lead us around to the topic of the built environment more broadly then? Well, one of the main issues that we have in terms of the role of the built environment and climate is that about 40% of uh, all emissions come from the built environment in some form. 
a lot of this in the UK is down to the poor performance of our housing. We have some of the worst uh, energy efficiency standards um, from all of Europe. And therefore, retrofit becomes one of the core focuses of the work that we need to be doing in the UK. So <clears throat> if this is a new term to anyone, retrofit essentially just means to um, take an existing building and work on it in a way that improves its performance, improves its energy efficiency, and should also improve uh, the well-being of its inhabitants as a consequence. So to set um, a sort of level of ambition that we need to be talking about, in Birmingham, we need to retrofit two out of every three homes by 2041, which will mean that by the time that I finish this talk, we should have retrofitted probably about 20 houses. So that's the level of ambition that we need to be working towards. And right now, as I'm sure anyone based in the UK is aware, we're not working anywhere near that level of ambition. We also know that housing has a huge amount of um, cascading impacts on society, whether it's health uh, of, you know, living in damp, moldy houses that causes us health issues, costs then get taken onto the NHS, whether it's um, things like the overuse of energy and in inefficient housing that then has to be subsidized by government paying to uh, private energy companies, Essentially, what we see right now is that the built environment socializes all of the negative impacts of um, poor housing while privatizing the, uh, the profits of that system. So within this immensely sort of complex and entangled web, how can we try and create a sort of more clear sense of direction and purpose within within this world of retrofit and the built environment what should be a cause that we're uh campaigning and pushing towards well for us it's a reimagining of what we're talking about when we have conversations about retrofit so as i'm sure many people are aware uh retrofit currently exists very largely in what's called the able to pay market so if you have a few um you know spare 10 20 30 grand lying around maybe then you can do retrofit but otherwise it's few and far between the opportunities for retrofit works when there have been uh government programs to support retrofit they've typically been very top down uh through things like voucher schemes, um, a big centralized contractor from another city over would probably come over and do the work. You'd likely never hear from them again after that. And this, this history, this way of carrying out retrofit previously has meant that uptake has been relatively poor and the work has been um, largely unsuccessful in terms of the level of ambition that we need to be having. So We've been inspired by groups like Carbon Co-op in Manchester who critiqued this typical model and strove to implement their own version of uh, community and grassroots led retrofit initiatives. We are trying to recreate that level of grassroots movement in Birmingham, but we're also aware that another problem with the existing model of retrofit is that it pursues an atomized house by house basis, which neglects the sort of um, interconnected, fundamentally interconnected and entangled nature of the built environment. So that's why, as um, we sort of briefly alluded to earlier, we're looking at the ambition of street scale retrofit rather than individual household retrofit. And we're trying to implement this through uh, a grassroots organization of residents, neighbors, um, and built environment and uh, environmental professionals uh, as a sort of insight into what the kind of civic infrastructure that we talk about at Civic, at civic Square can do and can implement. So one way that we've been, or some of the ways we've been trying to do this is 
in order to build this sort of movement around retrofit in communities at the scale of a street, one thing we have to overcome is the fact that there's not a very high level of literacy around the built environment and energy use. So in order to try and overcome this, we gathered uh, data on the street. Um, we tried to establish people with the, the what is of their current lives on the built environment. So how much space is given over to back garden space? How much space is given over to car parking? How much space is given over to front yards? Also, we connected people with other kinds of open data like energy performance certificates. So on the left, you can see the typical model of energy performance certificate, which is house by house. And as you can see, the standard performance across Birmingham is not great. Uh, but on the right, you can see a model of a street EPC that we've been trialing, which is a, a system to aggregate household uh, EPCs into uh, the street level. So to look at the street as a collective project, which people can work on together, moving it away from being an individual household consumer problem towards a collective social initiative. And this also means that you're less likely to have people left behind by the work as well. So these are some of the ways that we're trying to improve people's literacy and comprehension of retrofit, which is inevitably an incredibly complex a uh, tangled ecosystem of work, as you can see, illustrated by our partners here at Dark Matter Lab. So what we found is that in order to build momentum around these issues, it's not just enough to uh, build trust, it's not just enough to build literacy, but you have to ground the topic of retrofit within a larger sort of narrative around how our lives can change more broadly for the better. And so that's why we're really uh, sort of inspired and why we try to embody all of the principles of deep retrofit specifically, because deep retrofit goes beyond just talking about the building fabric. It talks about uh, things like services, street infrastructure, waste management, how we can live within a sort of circular economy in our built environment, as well as just improve the energy efficiency of our houses. Talk to people about adding insulation onto their houses. People aren't going to be that excited by that. Talk to people about transforming their street into a thriving, lively space where people can um, spend time with each other, grow food, grow flowers. These are the things that energize people and bring them on board with the work. So in that spirit, a lot of the framing of the work we've done on the street has been, to borrow a uh, Rob Hopkins phrase, um, moving from what is to what if. So the what is is captured by the research we've done, the, the open data we use and share with residents, giving them a firm grounding in how their street is currently operating. And then the what if uh, allows us to connect uh, our neighbors with sort of inspiring global precedents from uh, sort of, you know, taking cars off streets in the, ne in the Netherlands to uh, the super blocks in Barcelona, things like this. So helping um, us to kind of collectively imagine what a street uh, like the one we work with in Birmingham might become if we pursued retrofit deep retrofit in a collective way and, trans and sort of reimagine the street for uh, a more regenerative uh, future. And so this is kind of the question that defines a lot of the work of uh, the neighborhood transitions portfolio in Civic Square. Uh, so the question is, what if the climate transition and retrofit of our homes and streets were designed, owned and governed by the people who live there? And this was the sort of main prompt that we used to launch uh, our recent festival um, this, this, re this uh, past summer called Retrofit Reimagined. So this event sought to convene um, built environment practitioners, residents, organizers, 
policymakers, uh, as many people, as broad of an umbrella as we could achieve from across um, the UK and beyond the UK to talk about these issues of how we need to shift our framing and our ambition of retrofit. Uh, and we began that with six of our own shifts that we've been trying to embody, uh, moving from individual to collective, house by house to street by street, fragmented to accessible, centralized to distributive, short term to long term, and extractive to regenerative. So this festival uh, was a really amazing way of bringing everyone uh literally under the same tent because it was hosted in a tent and it was an amazing intersection of people organizing where they are around the topic of retrofit and people who you know spend their lives working on this topic in more of a professional background or um, a sort of decision making context it was uh covered quite well in some uh magazines from the architects journal to architecture today and uh the architects climate action network also released a report on it so if you are interested in learning more about the festival please look it up every one of the talks was recorded very meticulously and is available on youtube so definitely go check that out if you want to dive deeper into anything that i've spoken about today and so essentially what came away from this festival because it wasn't just about sharing these ideas and celebrating work and connecting people. It was also about trying to understand or gain a certain level of consensus around people working in this space on how we need to shift the work of retrofit going forwards. And from my perspective, one of the key shifts in how we think about this work and how we think about the existing built environment through a framework like donor economics is we need to take this existing framing, which is that retrofit and the built environment represents a technical challenge that must overcome social problems. We need to take that and shift it to a technical task that depends on social movement. And the sort of really key distinction here is that it's not a technical challenge because we've had the technology for decades. Uh, if you go to the Center for Alternative Technology in Wales, you'll see that they've been retrofitting buildings, they've been putting solar panels on roofs for years and years and years and years. So the technology is there. Uh, what it fundamentally comes down to is an issue of governance, and an issue of the social movement necessary to drive and motivate governance for a uh, just transition that retrofit is a huge part of. So when it comes to thinking about this through the lens of governance and social organizing at the scale of the street, one of our biggest challenges then becomes the fact that people are very time poor. People are struggling uh, much, much more than they have been for a long time due to things like inflation, energy costs, childcare, all of these issues that, that confront us in everyday life. That is a barrier to the social movement necessary to drive for this kind of governance. So we see the street scale and this kind of access to common space and a common movement as a way of taking what is currently an individualized time and energy deficit and sort of bringing that together into a surplus of the commons and we were able to see this in a really great way on the street uh through our own organizing so to give you a very you know micro example of this when we meet with neighbors on link road the street we're working with for this retrofit project they've said to us several times that they never would have been able to get involved with this kind of work but because we're doing it at the street scale, it means that they're able to balance and share things like childcare responsibilities. So something that would have been an individual deficit of time and energy has become a surplus due to the uh, sort of strategy of doing this work collectively at the scale of the street. So that's, that's sort of what we mean, you know, as, that's a material example of what we mean when we talk about going from the deficit of individualism to the surplus of commons. And so one way that we're trying to further the development of this kind of governance on the street, this kind of 
social movement that we're starting to see formed um, through this kind of work is we recently launched something called the Link Pro Dream Fund, which builds on um, uh, a program that Civic Square launched during COVID, which was um, the original Dream Fund, which uh, was, was a sort of way of supporting artists during lockdown. The Link Road Dream Fund is specifically uh, a microfunding initiative that allows residents to access small pots of money to implement small scale uh, projects, changes on their street. And so residents have proposed things like uh, water capture, things like um, parklets, uh, sort of public gardens. All of these things are to be held in the commons on the street. And in this way, we can see that through a tangible process of implementing these projects, socializing them on the street and maintaining them, the kind of governance and the kind of social movement that we know will be necessary for the larger retrofit work can begin to form through these initiatives. And so you can see sort of some of the beginnings of these projects here. You can see some of the... Um, ways that we've been working with neighbors uh, and trying to build this kind of literacy and knowledge from simply demonstrating uh, solar technology to using thermal cameras to understand building performance. Uh, this is the sort of on the ground organizing that goes into this kind of work. And so, yeah, a long-term vision is, um, maybe more medium-term vision is that through this kind of hyperlocal governance, this social movement, we can raise through philanthropic funding the uh, resources necessary to retrofit uh, Link Road, this street, in a way that is governed by the people who live there. In that way, we can build a really incredible demonstrator of what it means to do a locally led street retrofit project. And we can then bring this as a demonstrator to any new incoming government that may arise in the next few years and look specifically at uh, how we can show this civic initiative as an alternative to typical public-private partnerships. So rather than working with a big centralized top-down contractor, why not work with streets, neighborhoods, communities, to retrofit their own homes and streets, because this demonstrator, we're hoping, will prove that it's not only possible, but incredibly effective as well as just possible. And hopefully that will lead us to the sort of just transition and uh, built environment within the donut that we know uh, we need to be moving towards. So yeah. I'll leave it there. I don't think I've gone too far over time. So hopefully uh, that's <laughs> that's okay on the deal end there. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks so much for, for sharing that and for demonstrating what, what regenerative and distributive by design looking deeply at a street level can uh, can look like. We're a bit over time. So I'll pick up one question and maybe you can pick up the rest in the chat uh, while, while my presents. There are a few questions uh, coming in. One is, uh, one I'll quickly ask is the Civic Square example requires a lot of care and input from citizenry. Surely to reach the goals of the donor, there needs to be a more passive adoption. How have you considered scalability? Yeah, so may, that, maybe that question came in before the very it, end. Maybe it uh, was. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the idea is that um, <clears throat> building on a lot of work that we've seen from others, particularly uh, uh, Commonwealth, Commonwealth two words, if you know about them, uh, we're building on this idea of um, an alternative to a public private partnership. Uh, they call it a public commons partnership. We use the phrase of public civic partnership, but they all kind of refer to the same thing, um, looking at how public bodies, local uh, councils, government can work with uh, civic institutions um, to, to do this work um, effectively and uh, like you said to have that ambition that national ambition and uh, scalability. Thanks Charlie and I'll, I'll pass on to Mary now but if you can pick up the, the, the rest of the questions that are, that are coming in chat that would be uh, amazing. Uh, so Marie uh, Indrelid Winsfeld is a sustainability director at Half Eindom, that's Oslo Port's own development company. 
uh, designed with a social mission to create a sustainable fjord city and values for the city harbor and society. So Marie will specifically share the work of Havaindom with Donut Economics as the basis for urban development of Grönilkaya, a new fjord district in Oslo of over 200,000 square meter. Uh, Marie, the floor is yours and we can... Yes, thank you very much, Leonora. <laughs> So we had some technical issues. Um, I I changed to the PDF mode. So is it okay? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It works as it is now. I then I'll just leave it like that. <laughs> yeah. Go for it. <laughs> okay. Very well. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the invite. Um, very honored uh, to be able to present some of our our insight and our work and receipt for. Uh, for Grendekaya in Oslo in Norway. And also thank you, Charlie, very uh, inspiring to hear uh, what you are doing there. Um, so yeah, I, I felt like, well, I would like to go there and <laughs> see it <laughs> and kind of meet the people over there. Um, yeah, so uh, I work for Havaindom. Havaindom is a property development company fully owned by the Port of Oslo, which is part of Oslo municipality. So we develop the former harbor areas and the profit we generate goes to develop a climate friendly and sustainable port and harbor. And as well as for people there to enjoy. Um, so we, our mean is to develop the seafront uh, for anybody uh, and as well to modernize the sustainable port for the port of Oslo. Yes, so uh, our social mission is uh, to create the sustainable fjord city with value for the city and the harbor and for everyone living here. And uh, we shall maximize uh, the economic value creation as well as the social utility of what we are creating. And to give you just a broad overview of the work we are in, this is how it looked like in uh, the harbor, uh, nearby harbor of Björvika in 2001. It uh, was said to be a traffic machine and it was really a barrier, as you can see, between the city itself and, and uh, the seafront. So there were some brave politicians back then and uh, others that were willing to take the chance. And fortunately, uh, this uh, work then started. Now, Björika is now the heart of Oslo, new heart of Oslo. There's many hearts in Oslo. <laughs> With meeting places and uh, for culture, for work, for residents and uh, just come together. And we have Aindom and this part of the of this development owning 66% of this area. However, we are currently only halfway. So it's time to figure out how to improve and learn from, from what we have been doing so far. And um, you can see here we have a, just a, a little figure of the the beach in Oslo. It's a new beach in Oslo, opened in 2021, last year. And it's uh, for everyone, it's free, it's public. This is part of what, what we are doing for public. So now, Grönlikaya, is that the last piece of uh, and puzzle of, uh, of the Fjordby? And it's, uh, as Leonora said, it's 200,000 square meters. And it's, so it's quite a unique development project. And we want to use what we have learned from the, the later development, but also what's to come. It's the easternmost part of Björvika, and it lies to, between um, Ekeberg and uh, Lohavn. And uh, we have uh, also a river coming up to Alma the Alma River. Um, so it's all, the, the whole part of this is, uh, is what it's going to be developed. It's a big area and it's consisting of uh, over 1500 uh, residents, uh, thousands of workplaces and also open public areas 
free areas and the one kilometers of Havana Promenade Fjord as a port promenade um, going alongside all the way here, which is also free and for public and it needs to be developed in, in the most social, social way. Uh, so, as the background from uh, the UN reports, we have seen that 17% of the global emissions are linked to urban areas, which gives us uh, a, a very great un unique opportunity to be part of the necessary transition and the change on how we develop, build, and also plan for living uh, our lives. And to achieve this, we have to find out what do people want, what do they want, and we have approached communities and we have had an extensive participatory process where we have uh, talked with and engaged uh, people that, not, that are not so usually heard, like preschool children, youths and elderly, and uh, people with other disabilities as well. And uh, it's resulted in 10 recommendations for the Fjord city and the east sides. Then we see that this is a, it's a very big uh, project, uh, and therefore there we have invited 16 architect teams to, uh, to find out the best way on how to develop this uh, Grenlikaya. And uh, many, many good uh, solutions have come out of that. And we are still evaluating all the 16 teams. It's, it's, a, it's a very great task even to evaluate. They have done a great work, all of them. And they got also to know uh, about our work with uh, Donut Economics when they were given the task. So they had an the insight from our work with the Grenlikaya and Donut Economics in Grenlikaya. We call it Daig, which means dough in English. So the findings from our dough so far is, is to try to find out the good life within, how we can create a good life within the planetary boundaries. And this is then some of the Grenlikaya's neighborhoods and the neighbors, and we, we, we want to stress the importance that some of our neighbors are also in the sea. <laughs> they are, can be fish or other species. Uh, so uh, Grenlikaya, we wanted to develop it according to the donut principles. And uh, that's, that, that should be the prerequisite for the growth and development for a fair and benefit a larger part of the city's population for the people people for the recreation, for play and for work and for people living there and how to facilitate public health that it's root, also rooted in culture and, and to the history of the place. So that's why Havain Dom used the donut economics as a fundament for the urban development of Grenlikaya. So together with the uh, Future Built uh, Green Building Council in Norway, uh, the Rodeo Architects and the researchers' advices from a lot of different companies and also from public has been part of this uh, insight so far. So it's a uh, it's, um, great um, communication and uh, contribution and from a lot of different participants. So what we did then looked at the donut economics uh, theory and we looked at the creating city portrait and then based on that we we did uh, a lot of testing and we tried it out and then we made our own recipe. Yeah, so Leonora has gone through this as an introduction to you just to see how we come to our own uh, recipe. We, uh, as you see here, we looked into uh, all the four lenses, both on the local uh, local scale and the global scale for the on the social be social benefits and affecting, and also the economic uh, uh, affecting. And uh, then we looked at what is 
what is what all, all these different uh, issues will be most will be most affect when we when we develop Grunica or be affected from and that's why it's been quite a thorough process to go into it uh, this is an example on how we worked uh, to see how the consequence for a harbor promenade which I said it's going to be over a thousand meter harbor promenade for, which is supposed to be the access from the eastern side of the city to the fjord so it's very important that we manage to develop uh, this uh, harbor promenade for everyone and also that things are happening there that is free and it's it's interesting and it's it's going to be a social place by itself so if you see here that the potential is light green this is only a very brief example it's it's when we did this work we had a lot of lot of these stickers so this is just an extract just to show you how we worked and uh, what kind of meaning it gave for us in uh, in planning so we looked at like the potential uh for uh for the access to the fjord for the, on the social uh, scale and local social is very important but then we have the the red here is is uh, representing uh, kind of challenges that we saw because it can be conflicting with the interest with visitors coming there and residents <clears throat> but we also see that when we know that now we can plan it better and then we see also on the ecological side that it's a, it's a great potential to regenerate the nature and the, especially the marine life if we do it right, <laughs> which is of course a challenge, but we can also step wrong and then it can even make the Oslo Fjord, which is a dying fjord, it's not dead, but it's dying and we can make it worse if we do it wrongly. So it's very important that we know this and that we balance it. And then, of course, when we build a, um, a promenade like that, it, it's 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 needed that we have a lot of resources, materials uh, to to actually build it, which then again extract important resources from elsewhere, and also will create energy use and and also carbon emissions. Now, that also in the global scale, which is was kind of maybe for us the most. Uh, new to kind of think in a global social scale how the materials we are using will maybe affect people elsewhere in, in the world where they are producing it, it excreting the, the materials and uh, producing them so it's also quite this was very important for us to look into how to yeah how to to see that these different consequences now it's not like we want to 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 choose one or the other it's more that we have this is was a way for us to understand that it is a lot of potential but it's also a lot of challenges and if we want to to do this development we, we need to address them as early as possible and then we might find good solutions that actually can give us the means to to do it so that we can achieve the access to the fjord from the eastern side of the city, which the promenade is, is the, um, the main reason for. And at the same time, if we build it with uh, maybe reused materials or climate friendly materials, uh, it can be a, a good development. So out of this work, <coughs> we uh, we did a lot of, uh, we made a rec receipt and and uh, one of the most um, uh, important thing is that you just have to start. That's number one. You just really have to start the, the process. And then you establish an interdisciplinary co cooperation group. You create a knowledge pool and you use the four lenses. Out of that, you develop a, a sustainability strategies. That's where we are now. We are using all this insight now to make our own sustainability strategy for for Nikaya. And then, of course, how physically this will, these strategies also will influence the project. So this is more the detailed uh, part of the recipe. Uh, so as I said, the the thing is that we need to start early. We started. Uh, actually after the planning process had started and also 
the participatory process had started. Uh, and we would recommend everyone who wants to just push on the button and start it as early as possible. It's, it's nothing, just, just to get going and then you learn. And just to get the insight of everything, um, I think that's the most, it's not, it wasn't too late for us. And I think you can even start later, but the, the, our experience is that you should start as early as possible. So yeah, to establish a group uh, for uh, interdisciplinary cooperation, as I said, we had uh, working with, uh, with different uh, uh, Green Building Council and Future Build and, and a lot of advisors and also with the public. And that can differ from, from development to development, how and who you will, um, who you will uh, try to establish as a working group. I think it's good to have one kind of a group, but then you, you need to be sure that you, you're sharing all the time and maybe other groups are coming along and being interested that you should take on board. <clears throat> yes, to create a knowledge pool, we, we realized even though we had a lot of researchers and advisors so from different fields, we, we still found that we needed more um, knowledge base and we needed to bring more people in. And so we, invited people for like inside seminars on topics that we did not have uh, inside in the groups, like on like on the global social uh, issues, um, how to how to 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 see through that we are actually um, uh, buying like the building materials in in a, in, in a proper way. So that could be on materials for someone, that could be on social issues. So just to try to, to make sure that you, whatever you, you think you don't have the knowledge on, find, find it out and then you bring on the ones you, you think you need. Uh, yes. And yes, then of course you sit down in the, in the groups and you work with the four lenses, which is really an active, uh, Phase, uh, we were using you doing a lot of our work during lockdown, and then of course, in in uh, it's more uh, web based, and we used to work in Miro the platform, and it worked very well. Um, we also had the opportunity to do something physical, and that's of course a, a different way. So, I think both uh, both the digital version and the physical version has its uh, upsides. So maybe that was a good thing and that you actually could do it in both. But uh, try to or make it very, very organized and make sure that you do, that you have, that you have uh, bright reports from every workshop because it's a lot of discussions, a lot of insights coming through these workshops and uh, it's uh, very important to, to do not lose it. So then, this is where we are now. We are using all the insights. We have uh, like, we have a report here and it's an extract <laughs> of our uh, development work of, um, on 20 sites. And we, there are um, appendix on hundreds uh, pages um, in according to that. So it's a lot of insights to get into. And uh, we haven't uh, translated it all yet to English, but we are, we are, we, we want to do that. So that will come later. And um, for, unfortunately, there are not so many people speaking Norwegian. Um, it's still in Norwegian. Yeah, so this is where we are now. We are developing a sustainable strategy based on all the insights and all the all that we have had from the work and how we can bring this further to, to make it really work as a circular development of Grand Likaya when it comes to both the social uh, phases and also the more ecological phases. Uh, so, yeah. And this is uh, now the, the last, of course, how these strategies can influence the project. 
So this is also a bit like we have seen uh, from the, the 16 teams that are doing the, had done the work on uh, trying to, to figure out how we can plan um, and the, some of them have had quite good, good examples and innovating project on how we can reach kind of more circular way of building Grand Likaya, but also how it will work for people there, how they can have a more shared community-based uh, living approach there and how, how their lives will be in a more, more circular economic uh, new way of living. Uh, so we, we had a lot of good uh, examples and ideas. So we want to make sure that the neighbors meet and in Gidendekaya, and we want to stress the part that the nature is a neighborhood. Some of uh, the innovating um, ideas that so far have come out, it's, it's maybe we can use upcycle the construction from our uh, dark uh, offshore <laughs> industry to, to build part of Grand uh, that would be great. Uh, it's a lot of platforms out there that um, are not in use anymore, going for demolishing. So we are looking at how to maybe upcycle them, not to melt it and use a lot of energy, but use part of them as, the, as it is. So that's very interesting. And we see that if if you can manage that, we can really save a lot of um, uh, carbon emissions. So we want to go further. We have also the Philips Star. It's a next development area in Oslo, big area coming up. And uh, yeah, since I'm here also, we promise to share our insights, even though I say it's not in English, all of it yet, but we really want to share. We share it all to everyone who wants to have the insight in Oslo and in Norway. And we share it to everyone else. And maybe together with deal, we can find a way how to translate all of the insights that we have. And we want this to be uh, the future that it's for everyone and every time of the year, not just the summertime, but it, that it's also going to be public spaces and uh, inviting places for, for everyone. That's the really a high social goal that we have for Grenlikaya and how that can be strengthened through our work that um, everyone can now love the fjord beer. So yes, try thank to you. push it in within the time frame. So. Thank you. So, thank you, Mary. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I, we have just, uh, we're a bit over time. I'll pick up, pick up one quick question, but then I'm sure that People can also follow your work and hopefully more and more pieces of it will be translated into English as well. We have uh, Andreas asking, what do you think it takes to implement these great ambitions from the strategy? It's a big question. Yes. <laughs> maybe you can you can think of some in core insights in, in terms of what are some levers of, of, of transformative change. So, so the question is how we can... Uh... Yeah, how to turn the strategy into actual implementation. Mm -hmm. So that, that is actually where we are now. <laughs> we are making this strategy and then we are going to see how we can implement it. But I think already we see that uh, it, it's, it's the way you are actually planning, how we are planning to build and, and how you are planning the this um, part of the city to be later i mean how how we plan it to work for uh, for all the, the the people who who we think that should be invited in here um so it's it's actually that that it's that combination between the social issues and how we can physically uh, make the means to to make this work for uh, People. That can be how the, the houses are, housing are developed, that it's more planned for sharing, which can now be the phase of looking at how can different models for, uh, for housing be developed, uh, where you can share. That's both good for maybe the show, social interaction, but it's also good for climate because we can then be more efficient with the, the resources used 
and when 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 Grindelka is is um, developed and it's uh, people are moving in and they're working there and people are visiting Grindelka. Thank, thank, thank you, Maria. And I think I, I see a common kind of a common thread between your work and Charlie's work in that we need mm. to be recognizing and donut economics in a way helps us to do it is that we maybe shouldn't be thinking anymore in terms of trade-offs between social and environmental benefits, mm -hmm. but real, rather co-benefits in how to make a climate transition whilst benefiting the so social well-being of, of everybody. I We we have to uh, wrap up now, uh, I'm afraid. So thank you very much, Charlie. Thank you very much, Mari, for joining us. Thank you for everybody that joined us today. If you are, this is an area of work in which we'll kind of continue to explore and deal with everybody else. If you're working in the built environment in architecture planning and you're starting to use donut economics in any way, feel free to reach out. You have my, my email in the chat and, and deals contact form as well. And I hope we continue to have these discussions and kind of jointly explore what it means to be regenerative and distributive by design in our, uh, in these disciplines. Uh, so thank you everybody and have a have a great rest of the day. We'll have this uh, webinar shared online as well for those of you that, that want to come back to it and along with the work of, and links to Charlie's and Mar Mara's work.